All right, this is History 1301. This is a lecture on the uh, pre-Protestant Reformation, the time period before the Protestant Reformation, and uh, will set us up for the Protestant Reformation going forward. Well, anyways, uh, the, uh, the last few lectures have been dealing with exclusively the Spanish and their practices, habits, and so forth, the way they were, what they explored, what they were up to in the New World, and, and what have you. As I said in a previous lecture, the Spanish are going to uh, invade Mexico and lay claim to Texas and other parts of the world, uh, other parts of the Gulf Coast anyways, in 1519. But a couple years before that, in 1517, which is a pretty big date, uh, you're going to see what is uh, formally known as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And so that's where we tend to turn our attention to today. We're going to be looking at European history, especially religious history, and especially at that uh, Catholic history as well. But in the pre, uh, the pre, the centuries prior to, so like two centuries or so, maybe three centuries, uh, arguably, and frankly longer, but the, say the two centuries or so prior to 1517, you're going to be seeing the, uh, the Catholic Church as the dominant religious force in all of Europe, excepting, say, uh, Russia. Uh, the fact of the matter is Russia and uh, to it also Greece as well uh, are dominated not by the Catholic Church but by the Greek or Russian Orthodox Church respectively. Uh, they'd had a split in the 1200s. But for our purposes and our interest considering that we're going to focus a good deal upon English settlement uh, and uh, the Anglo influence or the English Anglo, Anglo, let's just use that word, Anglo influence in the future United States, uh, our relationship and our understanding of Catholic, the Catholic Church Church and its dogmas and practices uh, are far more important than that of the Orthodox Church. Anyways, the Catholic Church uh, is uh, the dominant single institution in the Western Hemisphere, excuse me, the Western, uh, in Western Europe, or even Europe generally uh, in the years prior to 1517. Of course, uh, if that's the case, uh, then, and I think it is, uh, then the most important person in Europe would be that of the Pope himself. The Pope, uh, for those of you who are not Catholic or not familiar with Catholic uh, dogma practice and organization, the Pope is the head of the church, which, by the way, if, if I were you, I would start making little notes here or there where I start laying out what a Catholic believes and how Catholics practice. I would lay that out and make sure you understand that the, uh, you'll see uh, Protestants disagree very vigorously on many, many points we're going to be discussing today. And so one of the things really, I guess, is I set my tables and I lay out my pawns if this was a chessboard to teach you how to understand this. And again, uh, I think you need to understand this to understand the thinking of 1301 history especially. Uh, you need to understand that um, Protestants and Catholics have very different views on what it means to go to church and what, how they view theology and what have you, and some of which we'll go into some detail on, others will pass by, by very briefly. Uh, but it, it is, uh, yeah, this is uh, going to shape and, and uh, to, it's going to shape the thinking and it's going to shape the practice of many Protestants playing off and against what the Catholic Church does. So anyways, the Catholic Church, as I said just a second ago, the head of the Catholic Church or the head of the church to say it more generally and probably more properly from the views and the eyes of, the, of, of Rome uh, would be the Pope. Now, uh, now, obviously right there, and I'll say this later in the next lecture, the, the vast majority, in fact, almost all the Protestants will say, no, that is not true. The, the head of the church is not, is not Rome. The head of the church is not the Pope. Well, anyways, uh, the Pope uh, is uh, located, the Bishop of Rome, as he's known also as, uh, is located in, well, Rome, or more specifically, Vatican City. And some of you who are Catholic are going to be saying this is going to be just like Catechism 101. Your times, uh, if you grew up and went to a Catholic church or particularly a Catholic school, uh, perhaps some of this will be just simply a review for you. But the head of the church is the Pope, and uh, under Catholic teaching and practice, uh, the Pope uh, takes his lineage. The sitting Pope right now is Saint Fran excuse me, uh, Francis. Uh, the uh, Pope Francis, <coughs> excuse me, Pope Francis takes his lineage, as does every Pope according to uh, dogma, uh, takes it from Peter. Uh, and the reason the Catholic Church claims that Peter is the first Pope, the first head of the church, is because Jesus says, you are the, uh, Peter, you are the rock upon which I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
So uh, going from that passage of Scripture, the Catholic Church sets itself up. Now, to be clear, the first, uh, Peter did not refer to himself as Pope as far as I understand it. Uh, and the, the, tr the formal office, as we kind of understand it today, doesn't really take on its uh, fuller trappings until much, much later, arguably in the time of Constantine and arguably after that. Uh, but you can draw a line of lineage. It's something akin to saying uh, the, uh, uh, say, uh, Donald Trump, who at the time of this recording is president. Donald Trump is in the line of presidents going back to George Washington. Does all the powers that Donald Trump or Barack Obama or George W. Bush before him uh, have, were, were all the powers that they have the same as what Jackson or Thomas Jefferson or George Washington have? No, the office was much smaller, the country was smaller and different, uh, but the office does evolve, as it were, or at least change and grow over time. Same can be said for the, the papacy as well. So by the time you uh, get to the... Uh, the coming up to the year 1517, and again, I'm just using that as my stopping point. So the years prior to 1517, the papacy is going to be, is going to be con, uh, handled uh, and will be administered by men who are of varying degrees of, uh, have varying degrees of ability. Some men are very strong and uh, very aggressive and uh, uh, centralizing figures. They bring power to the papacy, bring power to themselves. Pope Urban uh, was at the second comes to mind. Uh, he was a very powerful pope. And then you have others that are out there who are pope or just merely uh, placeholders, uh, men who are, are, say, a bridge between one dominant or strong figure to a next. Uh, who are largely forgotten. Uh, other men are very weak in the office and are able to be dominated by kings or other bishops or other cardinals or what have you uh, and so forth. So the papacy is not, uh, is not a static institution. It evolves and it changes. It sometimes grows in strength overall, which I would argue, uh, at least up until 1517 with the Reformation. And then at times uh, in that period, just uh, it, it, uh, it shrinks back. Again, it depends on who's occupying the seat of Peter. So in addition to that, not only does the papacy have its role to play, the papacy is also, like I said, the head of the church. It is the top official, the top ecclesial official in all of uh, the church, the Catholic church, which is the church of Europe prior to the Reformation. I think it's fair to remember, too, and you probably ought to write this in your notes, especially if you don't know it or did not know it, is, is that the, the Pope is obviously the top, but the next uh, office that we should keep our, in mind uh, is that of the bishop. Now, I understand, so some of you are saying, well, what about cardinals and this and that and archbishops? I, yes, I understand, but I'm trying to just a simplification or a simplified uh, hierarchy of the church. Um, so the, the Pope's at the top, and then he in turn uh, consecrates and appoints uh, bishops. Uh, so like if you uh, grew up in the Catholic uh, Diocese of uh, Houston Galveston, uh, down around, well, obviously Houston area, that's an archdiocese. It is uh, administered by either a cardinal or an archbishop. A high, meaning a high-ranking bishop, but he was appointed by, and he was uh, set to work by the Pope. And then bishops, on the other hand, mark this down as well, are going to appoint and ordain priests, Catholic priests. So you have uh, the Pope, you've got bishops, and then you've got priests. Most of you, if you've ever come across uh, and dealt with somebody in the church who's an official in the church in the form of an ordained clergyman, uh, it was most likely the priest that was uh, the head of your local parish. Uh, so put that in your notes uh, clearly. So if you're talking about uh, churches in the Catholic terminology, the, probably the more precise way to describe a, uh, the church, the local church, like my grandparents went to St. Joan of Arc Catholic Church uh, there in Kirby, right outside a, a bedroom community in San Antonio. So that would be a, 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 it's a, a parish, the parish hall, the parish itself. And even in, uh, if you look at Louisiana, you get an allusion or a, a, a reference or a hearkening to that with the, uh, with the use of, instead of calling these uh, sub-districts counties over in Louisiana, they call it parishes. Very Catholic influence because of the French influence. Might as well say it now. Go ahead and put it in your notes. I'll bring it up later. Uh, the uh, French are Catholic uh, and will be Catholic uh, up until the time of, the, of their revolution in the late 1700s. And then arguably after that, it changes. But anyways, all that to say is that you will have, if you're, you're most likely as a commoner or as a uh, regular citizen to be dealing with, uh, with parish priests rather than the bishop or the cardinal and certainly not the pope. Uh, 
Well, anyways, but he is the head of the church, and uh, the uh, this uh, prelude, as I call it also, I'm looking at my notes a little bit, prelude to modernity, uh, the, shows the church itself not only just an ecclesiastical thing, and we'll get more into that in a second. I think it's fair for you to remember, too, is that the Catholic Church, uh, particularly in its uh, upper echelons, its higher levels, the Catholic Church is going to be very uh, much involved in things beyond that of simply just uh, administering the sacraments and being uh, religious and so on. Uh, so we're clear about this. The idea of a separation of church and state is uh, a foreign concept in this time period. There is no idea that, you know, that there should be a sphere between the state on the one hand and the church on the other, and it'd be like a wall to use Jefferson's famous phrase, uh, separating them. That's not true. That, that, they never conceived of that. That's, uh, just, whether it's Protestant or Catholic alike, no one thought of that. Uh, it just was that that's a, an Enlightenment concept. Uh, so that's a much later uh, deal, but that would be in the Enlightenment. You'd see that separation of church and state. I mean, shoot. Uh, Jefferson himself is a child of the Enlightenment in the 1700s. Well, anyways, uh, that's all there. So what you're going to get is the Catholic Church being very active in politics. It's going to be active. In fact, at times you'll find the, the Catholic Church having armies. Uh, the, uh, the Italian peninsula is essentially the papal states. It's, it is administered to one degree or another by the church. Uh, so the, the, the Catholic Church has much more than just ecclesial authority. It has temporal, meaning human authority. It has the ability to execute. It has the ability, meaning to, to deprive somebody of life. Uh, it is a dominant force. And so any monarch in Europe, such as an elector of Saxony, the king of France, the king of Spain, the king of England, or, or any other uh, monarchical or authority is going to have to at some time deal with and placate or try to cajole or remove or whatever uh, the, the church at Rome, uh, the, the bishop of Rome, and make him come to heel. So all that is to say is, is that it is a, uh, a big deal, and uh, the, the papacy is a dominant, dominant force. So uh, what you're seeing too also is, is that uh, the Catholic Church in, in the late, uh, in the 1300s and the 1400s uh, prior to 1517 is also going to be going into a period of modernity. Uh, the, modern, uh, the modern times are just starting to show up. Um, in the 1100s or the 1200s, even the 1300s, you will see people refer to that era negatively. And as I've said before to you, it was the Renaissance who coined the phrase is the Dark Ages. It is in that time period you're going to have one of the great thinkers in church history, a guy named Thomas Aquinas, uh, who's going to write some of the most seminal and, and dense, but also important, uh, thoughts on uh, theology, uh, church-state relations, and so forth. Uh, the people who lived in the 1200s or the 1300s would not call it the Dark Ages, but they, it was kind of a, as I've said before, kind of a, a burned over, I'll use, that's negative when I say burned over, but it was certainly a... Uh, a scholastic period of time dear, uh, prior to the Renaissance, the reawakening, as it were, of art sciences in the ancient world. But uh, those things are starting to come around and starting to, uh, to pick back up. By the time you get to the 1400s, you see the, the, the headwaters of the Renaissance really start to pull out, uh, like the headwaters of a river. Uh, you, you find the Mississippi River in a lake. Uh, and you can walk across it there in uh, the upper reaches of Minnesota at the headwaters. Just, just step across it, whereas, of course, just right down the road, you can't. Uh, but the headwaters of the Renaissance, which will affect the Catholic Church, will affect the Reformation and affect religion in general, I would argue, especially uh, Christianity particularly, uh, you're going to see a re-emphasis in this, uh, this prelude to modernity that's going to help bring on eventually the Reformation and later on the Renaissance. Uh, the fact is you're going to see a focus start to renew not on high scholasticism like a Thomas Aquinas would give you, but you're going to start to see a focus on humanism. And in a sense, what you would say is there, the focus is moving away from the hereafter or the heavenlies, uh, but to the human, meaning to the flesh in a sense. So what you see here is a focus on the five uh, aspects of, of ancient uh, thinking and ancient writing and practice. Uh, you're going to see focusing on grammar and rhetoric and poetry, history, ethics, and so forth. Uh, basically on the human arts or the liberal arts as we sometimes call them. 
In addition to that, in this prelude to modernity, you're also seeing a re-emphasis and a real push to add in virtue. And you start to see Christian, uh, Christian aspects added into the virtues, uh, virtues such as fortitude and prudence and justice. Uh, and uh, for, uh, prudence, justice, fortitude, oh gosh, um, temperance and temperance as well. Those are all the old pagan or cardinal virtues. Add in, say, three more, hope, faith, and charity, which are uh, basically, uh, so hope, faith, and charity, which are basically Christian additions to the pagan virtues. Uh, you see those being taught and emphasized in this uh, modernity. Also, this humanism, this uh, coming of the Renaissance, which will affect the church uh, in the 1400s, you're going to see a re-emphasis on the ancient languages. In the Middle Ages or the medieval period, uh, yes, people knew of ancient languages and they sometimes taught them, but there was not this heavy emphasis on learning the ancient languages. So put this in your notes. When we talk about ancient languages in the church or in the elite structures, and we're talking about the elite, mind you, not the, not the peasant in the field. The elite uh, would be learning in this uh, Renaissance or this coming Renaissance, this coming of the Renaissance, this, uh, this modernity period, you're going to be learning uh, Kone Greek, which is basically biblical Greek. You're going to be relearning Latin, for example, uh, perhaps some other uh, old antique languages, uh, perhaps Hebrew even as well, but certainly Latin and Kone Greek. Uh, the idea is, is that you're trying to get back to the original languages and learn what they lo uh, and learn, and not just rely upon translations as uh, seemingly they had. Uh, that's not to say that a Thomas Aquinas was uneducated or anything. He was highly educated, but the idea that a, a, a common uh, parish priest would need to learn Latin or a bishop, would, a, a scholastic bishop, not on the level of Thomas, but just a run-of-the-mill scholastic uh, priest uh, in a seminary would need to know Kanae Greek. That's uh, a new development right there. But also, last but not least, you even see this too, uh, kind of with the uh, hearkening back to the virtues. Uh, there is, in and around the year 1400 to 1500, a look back into the past past Aquinas, past the year 1000, and back now to Greece and Rome, and looking back at the pagan past and saying, ah, oh, there were some good aspects that we need to resurrect and bring back uh, into our existence. The chief example, of course, would be the virtues, uh, but perhaps the love of learning and, and practices and other habits as well. So all that's going on. There's kind of this new churn and this new intellectual uh, activity and uh, historical activity uh, taking root not just in the church but also in the upper echelons of European society. Those people who would be cloistered, as it were, in a university, those would be cloistered in a seminary and what have you. So also uh, we should make note of, too, this is not only you have the stir intellectually that's a reawakening uh, Europe, in a sense, we've already talked a little bit in a previous lecture about this, uh, the Crusades having a part to play as well. But also what stirs the pot in England, or rather what stirs the pot in Europe as far as the politics and the church, has to do with what you can call in your notes the Babylonian captivity of the church. The Babylonian captivity of the church is a reference to the Old Testament. Give me a second. The Babylonian captivity of the church is a period of time, 1309 to 1417, where you will have the papacy decamp from Vatican City and Rome and move all the way over to the, the uh, city of, of Avignon, France, A-V-I-G-N-O-N, Avignon, France. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, the papacy is the most dominant and important uh, body or position in political Europe. And if the king of France, in this case, has the papacy uh, captive in his backyard, it needs to say it would make the, the, the king of France or his successors a, a, themselves very dominant uh, as well. The papacy in this time period is occupied by generally weak individuals, meaning weak men who are easily dominated by stronger men. Uh, sometimes the overworked phrase, the alpha male dominating the beta male. 
But all that to say, though, is, is that uh, the papacy resides in Avignon, and, not all, and, and Europe doesn't love it. Europe's not excited about this. There are complaints. There is intriguing. Uh, you see the Germans intriguing. You see the Spanish intriguing. They're all Catholic, remember, at this point in time, uh, trying to figure out how to uh, get the papacy out of France and maybe bring it to their own homeland, or certainly at least get them back to Rome. And so what you'll end up seeing uh, is, is that uh, during this time period, there will be multiple popes running around, uh, and rather there will be multiple individuals claiming to be pope. Uh, and at one point in time during this Babylonian captivity, you will have uh, three different men claiming to be pope in, at any one time. Now you may say, how does that matter and how does that affect me? Uh, and, and why do I need to know this? you got to understand this sort of thing from 1309 to 1417, particularly uh, with regard to three popes and different factions backing this pope or that pope or this claimant to the, the throne of Peter and so on, it'll rip, it'll start to tear at the confidence in the fabric of uh, religious society in Europe. Uh, again, I think it's fair to remember with regard to belief and faith uh, you will have men and women who are firm and committed Catholics who believe in the dogma and practices of the Catholic Church. They are, they were devout uh, Catholics, and this is true for elites, and this is true for those who are just common and poor. But you're also going to have, and it probably depends uh, where you're at and a few other things in there as well, but you will have always had individuals, it's, it's frankly in the Bible, but you will always have uh, the uh, wheat and the, yeah, the tares, meaning those who aren't believers. You will have those who go to church and those who genuflect and they cross themselves and they take communion, but in their heart of hearts they actually never believe a day in their life. Uh, but you always have had that basically since the beginning of the church. And so there will be those who never believe. But for the devout, but for those who believe to have three popes running around, that's a problem. Uh, realistically, it's like saying there's three suns in the sky. And, you know, I mean, it, it, you could talk about Star Wars or whatever. You can have multiple suns in science fiction uh, stories and so forth, multiple moons flying all over the place. But for us uh, in, on Earth, we have one sun in the sky and one moon. And so with that one sun in the sky, you can only have, uh, is it as, as I say, one sun. You can only have one uh, descendant of Peter. You can't have multiple popes running around. Now, the, th the next thing is, is that uh, how does that affect the, the common man? Well, what do popes do? I've already said it once. Popes create bishops, and bishops in turn consecrate or ordain priests. And so you have that hierarchical structure going down. You best understand this about Catholic dogma, especially if you come from, say, a, a Baptist or, or an evangelical setting where you were taught very demonstrably in Sunday school or elsewhere that uh, once you're saved, you're always saved, as, uh, as I grew up hearing it. Not everybody agrees with that. Frankly, you can go to various churches, even within the Baptist denomination, and find one that says, nope, that's, you can lose, you can, uh, in a fit of rage, you can lose your salvation, and then have the proverbial car accident. Uh, the free will Baptist would be an example there. Assembly of God, which is not Baptist, is uh, another example, and memory serves. Uh, the Church of Christ would be uh, a third one uh, in that same way. But all that to say is, is that uh, not everybody subscribes to once saved, always saved, if, if that's what you grew up with, <clears throat> saved from hell and saved by grace and so on and so on. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, teaches that you too can lose your faith. You can sin your way out of heaven. You can sin your way out of purgatory, and you can sin your way into hell. And so this, these are major deals. So if you are a believer, a, a devout believer, and you don't know who's the true uh, uh, bishop of Rome and who the true uh, bishops are for your neighborhood and who the true priests are, uh, how do you know if your salvation is secure? How do you know if you are doing what you ought to do to maintain that salvation? And also put this in your notes too, what does uh, salvation, or how does one uh, achieve, I say achieve, that's a little bit of a loaded word in, in this uh, discussion, but how does uh, one uh, become saved in Catholic dogma? Well, he needs two things, essentially. He needs, uh, he needs the faith, and he needs uh, to prove it by works. But at the same time, the faith is involved. And how does he uh, uh, achieve salvation, as it were? Uh, by frequent reception of what you can call in your notes the sacraments. The sacraments. 
That is uh, the, probably the most central uh, aspect and element to church life. Uh, the idea of the sacraments, that uh, partaking of the seven sacraments, you better write them down when I start ticking them off because I'm going to have them on the exam. But the fact of the matter is, is those seven sacraments are uh, big things. And uh, that is how one becomes a, a, a Christian, as it were, uh, with faith uh, and also maintains his Christianity or his Christian status and eventually uh, goes and... Um, and when he dies, he is uh, translated into uh, into heaven or purgatory. So uh, the fact of the matter is the se there are seven sacraments, and by the time of the 1400s, uh, at least it was actually in the 1300s, it's kind of settled out, uh, but you're going to have the s seven sacraments that you have to this day. And some of you, again, growing up in a Catholic church, maybe going to a Catholic school, learn those seven sacraments and know them by heart, at least you should. But I found also that sometimes people forget them too. So what are those seven sacraments? So let's start with the first one. Uh, the first one is going from uh, birth to death sort of thing, from the, the, the span of a life. So what's the first sacrament? Uh, it is baptism. So write that in your notes. It's baptism. Baptism in the form of uh, infant baptism, child baptism, the, uh, the, the baptism of the child. And, uh, and I say that because uh, understand this is that I'm a, I am Baptist and a Baptist does not believe in child uh, infant baptism. Uh, as you may know or some of you know quite firmly because maybe an argument broke out in your family one time, Baptist uh, or some evangelicals are believers in what's called uh, believer's baptism where you take the believer, he professes faith, and he's uh, dunked into the water and brought back up. Sometimes in a bathtub, sometimes in a, in a ditch or stream. I'll tell a story about Sam Houston later. But uh, there's a lot of other churches who are Protestant who don't practice that. Presbyterians, Methodists, and in some cases, uh, Episcopalians, Lutherans, and of course uh, the Catholic Church, which is not a Protestant church. It's, there's Protestants and Catholics. There's a difference. So the Catholics on the uh, start off with is, uh, is uh, baptism, infant baptism. So that's number one. Number two, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, confirmation. Confirmation. Confirmation basically means that first you were baptized into the church, and then secondly you were confirmed in your faith that, that faith is found in the individual. Normally, for most of you who have been confirmed, it's somewhere around the age of 15 normally, maybe 13. But confirmation, you were confirmed in the church, you are a Christian, and there is evidence of faith. That, too, is a sacrament, a saving sacrament. And I'll explain what a sacrament does at the end. But the fact is, not only do you have that, but also about the same time you're going to start giving, what, or you're going to perform what is known as reconciliation or penance or confession. Any of those would fit confession, penance, or reconciliation. The idea is, is that man is a sinful creature, and he's always sinful. Uh, this is, uh, transcends denomination. It transcends uh, the various compartments of Christianity. Pretty much every Christian church that has hit, uh, roots or is uh, faithful to the, uh, to, the, to the New Testament, bluntly put, uh, is going to have the idea of original sin in some form. Now, how they explain it, that's another story. But also that man is, in, to some degree or another, uh, sinful. And so if he is sinful, meaning he commits error, he commits uh, acts against God, uh, whether they are in the great and grotesque form or minor or in other cases, whether it's a lie or an adulterous affair, murder, and on, on or uh, heresy, if you want to get into the, into the doctrines, the fact of the matter is, is that whatever those sins are, they can accumulate, especially in Catholic dogma, <clears throat> and it is those sins that can uh, have you, in, a, in essence, expelled from the church. You would be, you have sinned your way out of the church. So how do you get back into the good graces of the church? And how do you get back into the good graces of uh, God? Well, you go and you perform uh, and you uh, give what is uh, a confession of your sins, those that you can remember and those that you uh, hope that you cannot remember. Uh, and you hope that, uh, uh, I say you hope, but uh, the priest acts as an intermediary. So you probably ought to put that in your notes too. Confession 
uh, in Catholic practice for the penance, or rather for the sacrament of penance to work, uh, there has to be an intermediary in essence, uh, and that priest, it will be the priest. So some of you gave confession once uh, early on in your uh, childhood or somewhere that you remember, say, at age six or seven, and maybe have only gone back once or twice since uh, to confession. Others uh, watching this may go to confession once a week, which is, uh, in a modern sense, in the 21st century, unusual. Most people don't go to confession once a week. They go maybe once or twice a year, some more, some less. It just depends on how uh, you uh, practice your Catholic faith. So anyways, all of which is to say is, is that it is an act, and it is between uh, the, with an intermediary in the, in the priest and uh, on behalf of, with a priest uh, toward God. By the way, as you might expect, that is a major point of contention between Catholics and Protestants for the most part right there. Uh, Protestants over the years have referred to it, and, it, and many Protestants, regardless of exact denomination, will refer to it as the uh, uh, priesthood of the believer. You don't need a priest to become, uh, to ha give confession. You just confess your sins to God himself, uh, and, and he will absolve you. And that's a major difference between Catholics and Protestants. So confession is in there. Uh, we've, had, we've had penance or confession, uh, confirmation, baptism. So the next step along the route of life would be what? And, and what's the next big and major step? The answer would be, uh, let's see here. Ah, uh, if you have the confirmation, you also have to have the Eucharist. The Eucharist, uh, so we're clear about that, or saying if you say Mass is on a certain time period or certain day, on Sundays or Saturdays or what have you, that is the celebration of the body and blood of Christ. It's important to remember, especially if you're not familiar with Catholic dogma or you come out of a Protestant, say a Baptist or a, a, a Pentecostal background, uh, the idea of the Eucharist is a very, a very big deal in the Catholic Church. Uh, you will see the Eucharist uh, uh, you will see the Eucharist displayed. Uh, sometimes you will see, I, I don't know if they still do it, but Thomas Aquinas Catholic Church there off of Highway 6 in College Station uh, used to at least, and I imagine they still do it, have perpetual adoration where people who could come in uh, and pray. And the, uh, the, 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 basically the host would be uh, displayed and you could pray. Now what are they praying to? Uh, in Catholic dogma, it is uh, the body of Christ. And in, in Catholic dogma, the cup at the at the uh, at Eucharist or at the Mass is the blood of Christ, not a representation, not a sign, not a symbol, no uh, no stand in. It is the body and blood of Christ. It's taken out of the upper room. And when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, I say it as a Baptist, but the uh, Catholic Church takes it very literally, this is the body and blood of Christ. It's not some sort of stand-in. Uh, and uh, frequent reception, and by the way, to come to the Eucharist, you need to have confession. Uh, it was true prior to the Reformation. Frankly, it's true after the Reformation that it sits in the dogmas of the Catholic Church, the catechism of the Catholic Church, basically, that if you are going to... Um, if you're going to take communion, if you're going to take the Eucharist, you best not have a, uh, a grave and mortal sin hanging over your head, an adulterous affair or some other sort of thing. You need to confess that uh, because uh, taking the, uh, the, the host unworthily can bring condemnation upon your head, as it were. So you've got the Eucharist. It's a big, big thing. So we've got uh, four of the seven sacraments down. Now, uh, continuing along the, the passage of life sort of idea of uh, what would be the next sacraments, for most people it's this next one, uh, with, one ex uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, this next one, for most people, it's going to be the sacrament of marriage. Write that down. Marriage is a big, big deal. Marriage is a gigantic thing in the Catholic Church. It is, it is, is on the same level, as it were, with the Eucharist, with baptism. It is a major thing. Whereas if you look in some Protestant churches, it's more, much more of a contract uh, than it is a, uh, or a, civil a civil affair versus a sacramental uh, church event. So actually, in a sense, you can say it like this. And some of you have been to Catholic weddings where not, and you're saying, oh my gosh, it was long. You go to a Baptist wedding, a Baptist wedding like mine took 12 minutes, 13 minutes at max. Uh, but a Catholic wedding takes a long time because, uh, especially if the Mass is celebrated in the, in the uh, marriage ceremony, you'll be there for a while. But it has a higher and a heavier meaning. 
fair to remember too is, is that uh, in Catholic dogma and teaching, there is, once you're married uh, and there is no shenanigans uh, in the marriage uh, arrangement, meaning there was no deceit or lies or anything that would, uh, meaning the marriage would, had been entered into unworthily or uh, deceitfully, once you're married in the eyes of the Catholic Church, that's it. There is no such thing in the eyes of the Catholic Church divorce. Now, you can get a legal divorce, and that's another story for another time. But in the eyes of the Catholic Church, to this day, you do not have a right to a divorce. Now, you may have what is called an annulment, but an annulment is more of that idea of uh, the man lied about this or that. It was a grave sin that he lied about, and therefore there was never really a marriage in the first place. So, uh, by the way, it's, as big as that is, it's, it could have some major and profound impacts. Let's think about that for a second. What if you were a peasant in Germany and you were trying to do right by the church, which means also by God, and you don't know whether or not the priest who's marrying you is actually a Catholic priest, and which of those uh, popes is he following? What happens to you if you uh, screw it up? Or, and whether it's your fault or not is immaterial, but what happens if you screw it up? It would be problematic. Uh, the thing is, is that, uh, and I'll say this now, and I'll, re I'll, I'll address it out more in a second, but the thing to remember is that the Catholic Church it teaches, and to this day teaches, that they hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So if you ever see Peter holding a set, of, a, a representation of Peter holding a set of keys, or he, normally you'll see him represented two ways, an upside-down Latin cross like this, or a set of keys. And if he's holding a set of keys, it's reference to Jesus who said right before, Peter, you're the rock upon which I will build my church and, heaven, and hell will not prevail against it. He also went on to say to his disciples, but particularly to Peter, uh, in a sense that uh, all that is bound on earth shall be bound in heaven to them. All that is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so that's the idea of the keys of the kingdom. So just think, if you get uh, sideways with the church or you get excommunicated by the church, the church is consigning your soul, your ever-living ever, ever living soul, to hell. And if hell is a real place, no one wants to go there. Anyway, so those are major things. Uh, by the way, back to the sacraments. I'll explain that more as we go, and then we'll get to the, uh, uh, how this really impacts. Um, but uh, the second one, so we've got five down. Now we need two more to go. If you don't get married, and understand this, in times gone by, unlike today, the idea of marriage was expected. And there was no, well, I think I'll just be a lifelong bachelor. Uh, you have them. I'm not saying nobody uh, didn't get married, but the idea that you would be a lifelong bachelor, it's uh, unreasonable. Well, I say bachelor, could bachelorette, I suppose. Especially for a woman in, in Western Europe, it would be, that was un unreasonable and unthinkable. Unless you were a queen. And that's Elizabeth. So, uh, anyways, all that to say, though, number five. So, if you were a, a uh, if you were feeling the call to to the ministry, call to the clergy, call to the priesthood, you would submit to number five or number six, I guess it would be. Uh, that would be the holy orders, holy orders. Uh, and uh, most of the time, and even basically since about the year eleven hundred, the Catholic Church has uh, had celibacy and. Uh, monogamy, excuse me, celibacy, not monogamy, that's a little bit different. Celibacy as one of the requirements of being a Catholic priest. It's, uh, it, it was uh, there. You can argue why did they do it. I'm not going to get into that. But it, for the longest time, it, about a millennia now, it has been a requirement to be a Catholic priest with one exception. Uh, if uh, you come out of the Anglican Communion, you, be, you started out as an Episcopalian, a Church of England uh, rector, and you uh, switch and become Catholic, and you are married, the Catholic Church does allow for Anglican uh, ministers to become Catholic priests, to have to go through seminary and so forth, yet there they are, and you will occasionally here or there find a, a former Anglican minister, now Catholic priest, with a wife and children. So that, that's the exception to the rule, but generally speaking, holy orders is reserved for those men who become priests. So that's, in a sense, you want to say it a little differently in your notes, they are marrying the church. They are marrying the church. So as I've actually seen a Catholic minister, a Catholic priest, excuse me, went to my, he was a priest over at my uh, uh, grandparents' church back when I was a boy, and he was not an Anglican uh, or anything like that, but he wore a wedding ring just like I do. And someone asked him, said, uh, how are you married? Well, you can't be married. You're a priest. And he says, I am. I'm, in essence, married to the church. 
And so last but not least on our sacraments here, uh, this last one you can write in your notes and call it in your notes extreme unction. Another way to say it is last rites, last rites. Uh, for those men or women who are on, de uh, on their deathbed, uh, it is the uh, classic scene uh, and see, shown in many movies over the years uh, of a Catholic priest uh, coming in to administer last, last rites to a dying man uh, before he uh, passes into the afterlife. Uh, you'll see it in a more general sense as a, a soldier or a sailor going off into combat. You will see last rites offered uh, to a group, a general absolu absolution for men going into combat because some of them, maybe many of them, will not be coming back out of it. So uh, you get ready to, to meet your maker. So that's the last of those sacraments. <clears throat> uh, these sacraments are uh, important. And uh, to stay in the good graces of the church, uh, you have to partake of them. Uh, if you do not partake of them or you took them wrongly or with a grave sin on your uh, conscience, uh, then you uh, potentially, like I said, could uh, damn your soul to hell. Um, as I said also, and I've said it several times just offhand, and you might have already caught it, is another one of those great division points or differences between Catholics and Protestants is over the issue of the afterlife. Uh, it has to do with the fact that almost all Protestants would say that there is really only two uh, destinations as you die, heaven or hell. On the other hand, the Catholic Church teaches uh, and uh, has uh, affirmed for a very long time now that there are three destinations, heaven, hell, and purgatory. Uh, for the Catholic Church, very few people, very few people go straight to heaven. Very few people are that uh, uh, good to make it straight to heaven without going to purgatory. And for those who are not in the fold of the church, they go to hell. Um, what is purgatory? Purgatory is, in a sense, a purging, hence the purgatorio. Uh, it is a purging of sins that were accumulated on this side of the grave. There were not enough sins or not enough imperfections to have uh, kicked you out of heaven, as it were, uh, but you cannot appear before God with sin on your soul. Your soul has to be cleaned. And it is said in Catholic dogma and teaching that purgatory is more painful and more hurtful than any pain that one could have experienced here in the flesh. However, you do have the hope and understanding that purgatory is preparing you, is purging you of those sins and those blemishes so that at some point you will be able to stand before God in his uh, purity and his holiness, his whiteness, and I mean that in the form of purity, uh, his purity and, and complete uh, absence of sin without uh, being dissolved. And so the fact of the matter is, is that you, after, if you're in purgatory, at some point you will make it to heaven. And, of course, that is Paradiso. I'm kind of just channeling my inner Dante. Uh, but at the same time, too, is, is that um, most of us, in fact, n probably 99% of us in, in Catholic teaching would be going to purgatory for some period of time, some longer, some less. Keep that in the back of your mind and keep that as a division point between Protestants and Catholics. So why does this all matter? It, it, why does this all matter? Because... I think it's fair to remember that our ancestors uh, prior to 1517 and frankly basically all the way to about like last week, and I say that tongue in cheek as a historian because in a sense it was like last week if you look at the sweep of history. Most people didn't live all that long in antiquity. They didn't live all that long until the 20th century, arguably. Uh, you don't see the, in the United States certainly, you don't see the uh, life expectancy rising all that much uh, until much, much later, uh, up till about 1900. And then, and then, of course, today, most of you who are watching this should expect uh, all things being equal, especially ladies. Sorry, gentlemen, we all tend to die a little sooner. Uh, but uh, all you ladies watching this, you should reasonably expect that you're going to live, uh, as all things being equal and so on, uh, statistically, you, most of you should live to be about 85 or 90 years old at this point. Guys, uh, we're not so good, probably about 78 or 80. Uh, but anyways, we always are about 5 or 10 years behind the women. Uh, so th there you have that. And so, we'll But in, the, in the, the time period we're discussing here with the Catholic Church in practice is, is that it is uh, not the case. Some areas, uh, especially during the plague, I mean, you're, you're looking at people who are just going to die. It's, it's a massive death. So uh, long life is <clears throat> certainly not assured. 
Average life expectancy depends on where you are, but somewhere between 35 and 45 or so, maybe 50. Um, a lot, and you're never quite healthy. It's fair to remember too is that they dig around in in the uh, archaeologists have dug around in the cesspits and the pools, uh, in the old septic tanks of uh, and uh, old ditches that we know were essentially latrines of these old major cities in Europe, and they they basically dug around in them, and even in parts of the Middle East, and they looked at the the, the feces. Feces will dried feces will tell you a whole lot about uh, an animal, as some of you who are getting ready to be vets might know. Uh, dried feces will tell you a whole lot about yourself. What how you doing? Are you healthy? What on? And what they found when they dig around in those old cesspits and pools, whether it's in Europe or elsewhere, is is that prior to modern times, most everybody had intestinal uh, uh, virus, not viruses, intestinal parasites, and frankly, were just not that healthy. So going day after day feeling just chipper and top of the world, especially at my advanced age of 43 as I record this, was unreasonable. It just didn't happen. And so uh, it was harsh. It was a hard life. Lots of diseases took you out. And frankly, the idea of disease uh, wiping out uh, portions of the population or just being part of sick most of the time, that was common. It just, it was... Uh, the bugs, as I've said before, the bugs had the upper hand or the viruses and the parasites and the bacterium had the upper hand until modern times. And so uh, it was a harsh life. It was a hard life. Uh, there was uh, no air conditioning. There was no heat. Uh, the heat you produced was what you got your hands on and you split. Uh, I, there was, uh, you can watch movies about it and get all misty eyed about how simple it was in the past. But I don't know if anybody here really wants to go back to the distant past and say, let us do it that way. It might have been better for the environment, but certainly wasn't better for the man or the woman. All that to say is, is that uh, life was tough. Life was brutal. And, uh, and we talk about this also from the women's perspective. I talk about it generally speaking. Man's got a back-breaking labor. But women have labor itself. And I'm not talking about uh, in the house. I'm talking about labor with children. More than a few women over the years uh, have had uh, extreme difficulties having children, and the more children you have, the more uh, the greater the chance of getting caught uh, in, with a bad pregnancy. And what I mean caught with a bad pregnancy is the child's turned wrong the wrong way. Child gets hung up on the birth canal. Uh, arguably, I mean, if you want to talk about times gone by, um, I'll just use myself as an example. If you translated my wife and I back into the distant past, kind of like we're talking about prior to 1517, or heck, even just 1850 or 1900 art. Um, first of all, we probably would not have had Caroline. Second of all, I would have died probably about a year after we were born because I had my gallbladder went haywire and they pulled it out and everything was fine after that. But gallbladders could kill a man. Um, and then in addition to that, had we had, were able to have Caroline or attempt to, Caroline was breached. She was turned the wrong way, and there was nothing you could do to turn her. And she, Caroline, would have probably died in the birth, and if not just Caroline, Caroline was delivered by C-section, and some of you were as well who were watching this, very likely uh, my wife would have died too. Uh, so uh, I can just use my own family as an example, and some of you can say, yeah, that, that, that was us. So... Uh, it was tough. It was harsh. So, I mean, ultimately where I'm driving with this, back to the, the original point of why do commoners worry about who is on the throne of Peter is because what do you have to look forward to in this life? Sometimes you have a little bit to look forward to. I'm not saying it's complete doldrums, but it's harsh. It's hard. So what do you have to look forward to? Well, heaven. Yeah, you may have to stop over in purgatory for a few years, but once you get past that, you, the paradise of heaven, seeing other uh, family members, going before God. And uh, if heaven is what, they, what the Bible says it is, assuming it is a place as well, it is an inexpressible joy that nobody can express adequately with the human tongue uh, these, uh, ever. And so it would be a, a, di a great dichotomy going from the hardship of, and privations of this life and going to the glories of heaven. And so uh, that's what you look forward to. And if you, if you were married by the wrong priest which, uh, who, who would have married you and you thought was the right priest and you had a baby with, that, uh, with your husband or your, your wife, uh, you had a, uh, had a false marriage, the child is uh, fatherless, it, it, it's, it's, it's got social ramifications everywhere. 
and it is a major problem. So I, I spent, I guess, probably 25 minutes talking about sacraments and uh, the Babylonian captivity, but these are some real, real problems in this uh, uh, pre-Reformation period that, that have to be straightened out, and eventually they do. Like I said, 1417 is when the Pope goes back to Rome, and that settles out. And how do you answer the question of who the real Pope is? Well, the church gave a blanket dispensation and said essentially that, well, God will take care of his own. And he knew, he knew those who were uh, true to him and true to the church and true and were faithful believers. And they were, they were, that was a real marriage or that was a real sacraments that were given. And so be clear about this. So I just want to wrap up on the sacraments. The saving grace of Jesus Christ, because that's what we're talking about now. The saving grace of Jesus Christ is conferred through the reception of the sacraments of the Catholic Church in Catholic, as the Catholic Church teaches. So that's why you do it, because Jesus saves. He saves, he, he extends his grace through the sacraments. You receive the sacraments. You are protected by Jesus and infused with, infused, not imputed, but you are infused with his righteousness and then eventually you make it to heaven. So that's, these are heaven and hell sorts of things. And for the devout, it's a big deal. For those who are skeptical or, or simply not believers, not so much. But it's fair to remember, too, that everybody, at least officially, was a Catholic prior to the Reformation. Whether you believe or not, it's another story. So, but it's not just a, an extended discussion about uh, ecclesiastical dogma and practices and all those sorts of fun things. Uh, it's, it's a different time. Modernity's just starting to dawn, as it were. I make it sound like light versus dark modernity, light, dark uh, religious dogma. I don't mean that. But you're just starting to, the beginnings of modernity and, the, and obviously the Renaissance shortly thereafter too, uh, or at the same, more or less the same time of modernity. The fact of the matter is, and hopefully this is still working. Yeah, there we go. The fact of the matter is, we talk about modernity. Uh, the Let's see me. But back again, here we are. One of the things about uh, the, the difference between the era of the Protestant Reformation and the years beforehand and even after and today is the fact that today we take what is sacred, and, and sacred can mean various things, but here we are in the form of the church. We, we take what was sacred, and we today, I, th I would argue it's a product of the Enlightenment as much as anything, which is in the 16 and especially the 1700s, uh, which basically what it does is it walls off the religion, it walls off the worship to a part of your life. You compartmentalize, to use a term. And so what you'd end up having uh, is, is that, uh, say, your sacred time is on Sunday because Sunday is the Lord's Day and most Christians go to church on Sunday with some exceptions. But the fact of the matter is you wall it off there. But your, the rest of your life, say, is on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And so you compartmentalize and, and so on. That's, uh, to me, that's a modern concept. Uh, you throw in the, the idea of the individual, which is uh, foreign to those in the past, at least the individualism as we understand it, very foreign to them. But the idea of the sacred being infused into society, all society, the sacred, meaning there is this great relationship between you, your community, and God, that is a big deal that uh, students also have to wrap their mind around as well. Because even if you're not Catholic, and even if you don't uh, sus subscribe to it, I'm now using historic history now, if you're a Presbyterian or you're a Lutheran, uh, back in the early Reformation, you may not subscribe to everything I'm about to talk about with this idea of the sacred being everywhere, but yet at the same time, uh, religion was uh, supposed to be an all-encompassing event and you ordered your life around your faith. And so there wasn't this walling off of for Sunday for church or maybe Sunday and Wednesday uh, choir practice or whatever. But in the Catholic understanding of the sacred, the sacred is everywhere. And so you're going to have, uh, you're going to have these the different ideas. And here, write these down. The first, uh, you might call sacred rites, R-I-T-E-S. Just simply for our purposes, those sacraments I went through a few minutes ago, the sacred rites uh, would be sufficient for our understanding of the, of the sacraments. Next up on your list would be what you might call sacred space, sacred physical literal space where in a sense, heaven or a portion as it were, I say heaven, I don't mean that quite literally, but in a sense that they did, but a portion of God comes down and had touched the earth and it, it, that because it, he had touched it there uh, through this or that reason, 
uh, it, it was a special place. And in a sense, if you want to think about it a little bit, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, particularly the story of Moses, the idea of holy ground, uh, such as when Moses was commanded to take off his shoes before the burning bush. So anyway, sacred space, uh, an example of sacred space would be obviously a church. Uh, you, if you're Catholic, you understand that today. That is, uh, uh, that is consecrated ground. Uh, you can even have uh, Catholic cemeteries, uh, sacred cemeteries there for uh, proper burials and such. Also, please put in your notes too, a sacred space would include relics, re where relics are housed. Uh, in the pre-Reformation period and even the early days after the Reformation period, the idea of a relic having special religious uh, uh, significance uh, is not unusual. It's, it's very, very common. A relic site would be, for an example, and some of these are more, uh, uh, to me, appropriate than others. Others are kind of uh, uh, just off. The fact is, is that, say, one relic, uh, say a relic site would be a, uh, the nails of, that had uh, nailed Peter to the upside-down cross, or the nails of Jesus. Uh, then you'll see others that are, uh, say, the th crown, supposedly the crown of thorns that Jesus wore on his head. And on and on, these relics uh, also are everywhere in different types. One was uh, some of the more bizarre ones, in my opinion, would be, say, the uh, relic, uh, relic site where the, the mother's milk of Mary was supposedly housed at. You know, I don't believe that, but at the same time, they, they did. And people will take pilgrimages uh, to those relic sites, and you could receive uh, special dispensations, uh, such as, uh, put this in your notes, um, oh, special dispensations such as, uh, oh gosh, I just drew a blank on it. It's Protestant Reformation. It's the biggest thing, it's supposedly the biggest thing, the, the uh, indulgences. Special indulgences for going to these holy sites, these uh, relic sites. A holy site could be maybe where a battle was. A holy site could be at a, a, a cathedral or something like that. But a holy site can mean uh, quite a few things. But sacred space where God was. In addition to that, you're talking about uh, some other things uh, that would also be sacred. I mean, this is a, a whole life sort of idea of religion and that uh, they had that we don't or we've lost. Uh, another one would be sacred time in the week. Think about that. I mean, what would be the sacred time during a week? Obviously, Sundays, especially in Catholic understanding of things. What would be a sacred... T By the way, let me say this clearly. So if you're thinking, well, does that mean you've got to go to church? The answer is yes. Uh, you are commanded to go to church in uh, Catholic dogma to this day. It is what they call a holy day of obligation. Go to church every Sunday. I mean, you've got to go, or Saturday night. Uh, the fact of the matter is that if you do not go to church on Sunday, let's be blunt about this, that under Catholic dogma to the present time, 2020, you are committing a sin. And that's on your, on your mark, on your uh, ledger. But how about sacred time during the month? Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, say, Christmas or uh, uh, perhaps Holy Saturday or perhaps uh, Ash Wednesday or some other, other time. But sacred time during the month, a special set-aside point uh, that uh, you're supposed to gather uh, in worship uh, as well. Sacred feasts. You'll have feast days. Uh, right now, I saw one as I'm recording this today. Is, uh, August uh, 28th. Today is the feast day of uh, St. Augustine, one of the great pillars of early theology and teaching in the church. Is one of the great uh, uh, figures in the church. It's the feast day today, as I'm recording this, of St. Augustine and uh, so forth. Uh, perhaps you can have a fast day, uh, that there was uh, some sort of plague or uh, what have you, and the local priest or maybe a, the local bishop calls for a fast. And so the sacred time is we fast from this period here. More commonly might be the fasting time would be, say, during the Lenten season, that you might uh, fast for a period of time over an extended period of time or just simply one day, restraining from the eating of meat. Some people say I give up beer, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, but it is designed to, uh, to drive you to greater and deeper devotion to the Almighty, and that's the idea of these fast days uh, in a, a, a opposite the feast day. Feast would be good, a celebration. Fast would be the, uh, the sackcloth and the, and the ashes sort of idea. But also you're going to have not just sacred uh, time, sacred space, as I've already said, sacred rites. Next up would be the idea of the sacred bonds. And this is the thing that knits society together under the headship of the fatherhood of God, but knits society into this communal Catholic uh, relationship 
the peasant to the king. The king has a, a, a duty to provide religious instruction and worship uh, to the uh, peasants and other things, but the peasant is bound to the king in a, uh, in a sacred sort of way. From the peasant to the church, the peasant is bound to go to the church, support the church, worship at the church, assist and aid the church, and the church is bound to provide the sacraments and provide all those uh, grace and saving things uh, that, the, that the church is, is uh, uh, charged with by Jesus. In addition to that, uh, sacred bonds, think about it still in the church, the bond between the clergy and uh, the church itself. Like I said a few minutes ago about that Catholic priest, Leslie Va Father Vance, uh, Father Leslie Vance, uh, he was married to the church. That was that sacred bond uh, in the holy orders. And even beyond that, just people who worked as stonemasons or in other guilds and uh, um, uh, we might call unions today, uh, but those brotherhoods, had a sacred relationship too. Excuse me, my voice is starting to give a little bit. But all that, <clears throat> all that to say is, is that there are sacred bonds amongst workmen and so forth, not to mention families and what have you. But the fact is you have all th that, and then last but not least, you have sacred behavior. So it's not just your relationship with the church. It's not just your relationship with your king or your family or the territory you live in or the sacraments. I mean, this is everything. You have sacred behavior such as private devotions and, and so forth. You say the creed. You recite the Lord's Prayer, for example. You pray the, uh, you pray the, the rosary, the Hail Mary. Uh, you have pious readings. You read about the lives of the saints and on and on. And then also you could say the printing press uh, is going to help this out, no, which is, by the way, almost something I could forget, but I'll add it here and I'll run with it more later. The printing press is going to come online too in the 1400s, and that allows for this idea of pious living and pious reading. Now, admittedly, most of the peasants who were in the Catholic Church uh, in this time period could not read, and even a good number of elites could not read. But the fact of the matter was the printing press is going to come in and play a large role in pre promoting this pious behavior this sacred behavior. So ultimately, this whole lecture is designed to show you and to enforce upon you this idea that for all of its flaws, and it's got a few, maybe a bunch, but all of its uh, aspects, the dominant force that orders not just the, the religious life of Europe, but the political life of Europe, the life of Europe is the Catholic Church. It is the glue. It's the bond of society in many respects. And so that when the Protestant Reformation pops loose in 1517, and we'll get that in the next lecture, it is going to set into motion some cataclysmic events, as you would expect uh, a, a, an attack upon the glue, as it were, in the ways that we have always done things, the ways of the church. Uh, it's a, a tumultuous time we're entering in, and it's going to have profound effect upon the United States uh, uh, directly by the people who, uh, who are the descendants of Protestants, and also there's a good number of Catholics who moved here too in the early days, and there's going to have wars and so forth over it. But the Protestant Reformation is where we go next. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon.